Hello, hello, good morning, everyone. May I ask to take your seats, please? Uh, we are about to start with the policy panel. We're just missing more. Okay, we're about to start. We're just missing Maury. <laughs> there he is. So let me welcome uh, everyone to the policy panel. Um, my name is Pierre Olivier Gouancha. I'm the economic counselor here at the fund and I will be moderating this, uh, this panel. The theme is the global economy, old trade-offs and new challenges. And I think it's fair to say that we're facing a very complex and challenging global macroeconomic situation right now. As the title of the panel suggests, some of the challenges are old. For instance, inflation, which is reaching levels we've not seen in four decades in advanced economies, or the strength of the US dollar, which is putting a lot of strain on emerging market economies and approaching levels that last seen in the mid-1980s at the time of the Plaza Accord, or debt sustainability issues, which is becoming a key uh, issue for many low-income and frontier economies, or the energy crisis that is taking a severe toll on energy-dependent economies, especially European economies, heavily reliant on Russian gas supplies. So there is a sense that some of the issues that we're facing are taking us back to the 1980s or even to the 1970s. But some of the challenges we're facing are also more novel. So for instance, the climate transition, whose effects on the global economy are being increasingly felt, or the risk of geoeconomic fragmentation, more generally of deglobalization, with the world turning inwards and possibly into separate blocks. This is something that is, we consider an existential challenge for us here uh, at the fund or the growing importance of non-bank financial institutions and the risks to global financial stability that this could create, something that was illustrated yesterday in the excellent Mundell Fleming lecture that um, Linda Goldberg uh, gave. So in this environment, I think the work of our policy panel is cut out for us. And luckily, we have an excellent set of uh, panelists, so let me introduce them briefly. Jason Furman, uh, um, to, the, to your left is the Aetna Professor of Practice of Economic Policy jointly at Harvard Kennedy School and Department of Economics at Harvard University. Works on a wide range of topics relevant to policymakers, including US and international macroeconomics, fiscal policy, labor markets, competition policy. Served as top economic advisors to President Obama, both as a chief economist and a member of a cabinet, and is now a non-resident senior fellow at the Peterson Institute. Uh, Phil Lane, next to Jason, is a member of the European Central Bank's ex executive board and the ECB's chief economist. Before joining the ECB, Phil was the governor of the Central Bank of Ireland. He has worked on a wide range of topics related to financial globalization, macroeconomics of exchange rates and capital flows, microeconomic policy design, and the European monetary integration. Now, Carmen, to my right, 
Carmen Reinhardt is the Minos Tombanakis Professor of International Financial System at Harvard Kennedy School. From 2020 to 2022, she served as Senior Vice President and Chief Economist at the World Bank Group and was Chief Economist at uh, investment bank Bear Stearns back in the 1980s. She was also a policy advisor and deputy director at the IMF and a member of the advisory panel of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York and the Congressional Budget Office Panel of Economic Advisors, among others. And Carmen, of course, Carmen's work has helped us to understand financial crisis in both advanced economies and emerging markets. Now, finally, next to Carmen is Maury Upsfeld. Needs no introduction since the conference is in his honor, but let me just say two words. Class of 1958, professor of economics at Berkeley University. In 2014-15, he was a member of President Obama's Council of Economic Advisors, worked with Jason there, I believe. And from 2015 to 2018, he had uh, my current job as chief economist at the IMF. Now, as we've already um, mentioned a few times, Maury is the preeminent scholar in international macro and has done a work on a wide range of topics related to the global economy. So let me uh, now give some of the ground rules for our panel. First, each of the panelists, in the order I've just uh, listed them, uh, will give opening remarks for up to 10 minutes, and I will keep uh, track of time quite strictly. Uh, then we will have some time for the panelists to exchange views, followed by Q&A from the audience, uh, and I will then turn it back to Maury for any concluding remarks. Now, Jason will focus on the US economy, the risk of a recession, and the current challenges for monetary policy. Phil will zoom in on the euro area, how to formulate monetary policy when facing a severe terms of trade shock, how should fiscal policy accompany monetary policy. Carmen will focus on emerging markets and the specific challenges they are facing, rising interest rates, low growth, high energy prices, the strong dollar. And finally, Maury, Maury will just offer his views on all these questions. Let me just start with Jason. Um, so I'll just step up to here. I'm uh, so honored to be here. Learned an enormous amount from the year I spent as a colleague, Maury's, and we're colleagues again, non-resident at the Peterson Institute for International um, Economics. Now, over the last two years, I've seen an awful lot of economic commentary that I would describe as possibilism. Last year, the argument that there'd be no inflation was it's possible the multiplier is low, it's possible the pandemic did no damage to supply chains and so will be fully at potential. It's possible the wage increases we're seeing won't translate into price increases. It's possible that anchored inflation expectations will keep inflation anchored in the short run um, and the long run. I think each one of those statements wasn't completely crazy in its own right, but collectively they were a description probably of the 85th percentile or maybe even 99th percentile of happy outcomes, not the 50th percentile. I feel like I'm still seeing that now. I read prominent economists and economic commentators talking about a soft landing using words like, it's not unthinkable that we have a soft landing, or there's a narrow path to a soft landing, and then devoting their entire commentary to elucidating and spelling out the not unthinkable or narrow path that to me sounds like the 85th percentile um, not the center of the distribution. The types of assumptions now are that job openings and quits can fall without the unemployment rate rising. It's never happened before. It doesn't mean it can happen now, but again, is at the middle of the distribution. That wage growth will slow, and that will translate into slower price growth. That long-run inflation expectations, which are anchored, matter, and short-run expectations, which are very high, don't that some prices will decline, like shelter, or some inflation rates will decline, like shelter, but other ones won't go the other way, like the unusually slow pace of medical and financial services in the PCE um, won't reverse. Um, when I look at all of that, to me, again, it feels possible, but it doesn't feel um, probable. So when I think about um, it, I try to put rough probabilities. Um, I have you know, this matrix in my head, we can quibble and debate whether these are the appropriate words for those numbers, but regardless, we can take any set of numbers that are mutually exclusive 
and come up with four probabilities that if they add up to 100, you can't say they're definitively wrong. Um, and you know, so I look at something like this, and I say a soft landing is possible. I put about a 13% chance on it. Uh, I put that 13% chance, and I define soft landing in this very specific way, unemployment rate below 4.5%, inflation rate in the second half of the year um, below 3 um, I think there's a lot of inertia in the wage price process that labor markets continue to be tighter than at any point that they were prior um, to the pandemic, that there's not a lot of room for margin compression, that there's other shoes um, to drop. I think the hard landing is a decent chance of a recession next year, but historically recessions have brought the um, inflation rate down by half a point to a point. They haven't uh, brought it all the way back down to two or even necessarily um, below three. If you look at plausible sacrifice ratios or other ways of calibrating it, you know, without an unemployment rate of around six and a half percent for two years, I wouldn't bet on the inflation rate coming much below three. There's a lot of weight on a continued um, overheating scenario where um, we don't actually have the recession, and I'm not quite sure why everyone's so sure um, we are going to have a recession with consumer balance sheets as healthy as they are with the momentum in the job market continuing to be as strong as it is. So a world where um, we are in almost the same situation again next year, maybe a little bit better now, seems to me quite plausible. Um, and then the plurality of odds I put on something I call stagflation, or I think more likely an incomplete hard landing, where you have a recession that brings your inflation rate down. It just doesn't bring it all the way down um, to where we'd like it to be. Happy to argue about these probabilities. They're a little bit better um, than they were two weeks ago. Um, I tried not to get as carried away about yesterday's CPI report as the financial markets um, did. I'll try not to get as depressed the next time there's a bad CPI report um, as the financial markets do, but you always want to be adjusting um, what you're thinking. Um, so what should the Fed be doing right now? I think they're sort of in roughly the right place. Um, ideally, what would make me nervous is if financial conditions were easing a lot, and in some respects the last day did make me nervous that we had a huge discontinuous easing in financial conditions on top of what had happened over the last week or two, although some was probably appropriate given the updating off of the wage number last week, the productivity number last week, and the CPI um, this week. In general, there's no reason I think the Fed needs to keep going at 75 basis points. Going down to 50, even going down to 25 would be fine with me. But if they surprised in a very dovish direction and financial conditions fell, that would make me more nervous, in part because I think, based on this diagnosis of the economy, it's more likely you're going to need tighter financial conditions than looser financial conditions. And I'd rather not see them ease and then have to undo that and see them tighten. Better to smooth it along the way. I um, want to address two concerns that people um, have expressed, both of which I think are quite reasonable. Um, one is lags and that policy might overshoot. Um, let me say, I think it's very unlikely that we're going to end up in a world where the inflation rate next year is below 2% or even below 2.5%. If that happened, then I think ex post, I'd say the Fed certainly did too much. That would be a sufficient condition, not a necessary condition for saying um, that they did too much. I think it's unlikely that they're going to overshoot. I think it's possible that we could bring the labor market to Nehru and just let the fact that we don't have a unit root on the inflation process eventually bring our inflation back to expected inflation. I'm not an incredibly doctrinaire believer in rational expectations, but if a process takes multiple years and it systematically puts your inflation above your expected inflation, at some point I'm not going to trust that your expected inflation is going to stay anchored in that way. And in that sense, the idea that you can just sort of wait it out and let anchored expectations do the job rather than letting any labor market looseness do the job, um, I think is, again, possible, but wouldn't be what I would describe as um, probable. So 
you know, there are costs of errors in both directions, but the cost of inflation becoming unanchored means your sacrifice ratio goes from something like zero, which is where it is when inflation expectations are anchored, to something that could easily be above 10 point years of unemployment for each point of um, inflation. Um, the second issue is breaking things in the financial system and the global economy. Um, and let me just say, I think central banks have a terrible track record of trying to understand these problems, anticipate them, and do anything preemptive about them through their monetary policy. I was never a fan of monetary policy acting preemptively to prick bubbles. And similarly, I'm not a fan of monetary policy doing the opposite now of preemptively not doing something um, for them. You know, there are examples. I think we were too timid in our response to the financial crisis in part because of concerns about financial instability. The best way to reduce those financial risks would be to use more fiscal policy and have more fiscal contraction, take some of the pressure off of monetary policy. We wouldn't need rates that were as high then. Not that optimistic that we're going to get that um, in the United States. And so I think the Fed just needs to keep raising rates. And if a problem develops, try to deal, deal with it with a facility without changing uh, monetary policy. And if it needs to change monetary policy, um, it can always do that. But the idea of trying to preemptively predict things that we have a terrible track record of doing is not something that I think should figure very large in monetary policy. Um, and that goes even more strongly for the impact of the dollar on um, the global economy, which I think has been under overstated um, in a number of respects. I think the Fed, like every central bank, has to largely look after its mandate, which is the United States economy. And if issues develop, those issues should more likely be dealt with by the IMF, by the Treasury, by other, and by other policies, rather than you know, the Fed adjusting the path of its interest rates to anything other than what's needed for its employment and price mandate. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Exactly on time. Very nice opening for a very similar set of issues that I'm sure Phil will want to discuss. Good morning, and it, it was a, a, an honor to be invited to take part in the research conference, especially in honor of Maury. I mean, really, from, from my point of view, uh, uh, for two reasons. Uh, one is, is Maury uh, has written uh, some really fundamental papers about the Euro and European Monetary Union uh, going back 25 years, uh, and so that, that that's greatly appreciated. And second, uh, the Euro area is a, a very open uh, economy to global forces, uh, which I'll come back to in, in this presentation. And so uh, international macro is you know, really at the core of how we, we have to think about the Euro area. Now, uh, maybe a little bit in style uh, difference, uh, I'm, I'm going to more focus on some of the analytical issues we face in understanding the inflation dynamic and uh, the role of fiscal policy uh, and some of these issues as opposed to uh, zeroing in on, on the next interest rate decision. So if you're hoping I'm going to uh, you know, announce what the next interest rate decision should be, I'm not going to do that. Um, so, so maybe some of you uh, are going to leave right now. But, uh, <laughs> Okay, so uh, maybe uh, you know, a, a useful way to, to gain some perspective is to think about things compared to pre-pandemic. So the start of these graphs is, is Q4 2019. Uh, and the left side show, shows the uh, inflation rate, uh, how it's evolved over time. Uh, and then, but it's also useful uh, not just think about the inflation rate, but think about the price level. Because of course, in terms of the cost of living and so on, is, is the cumulative impact on, on the price level is, is very important, which is sometimes obscured uh, when you just look at inflation rates, uh, which are basically uh, uh, this month compared to 12 months ago. So what you do see is this, uh, you know, really uh, from really summer 21 onwards, this upward march in, in the inflation rate. But what you also see in the European context is, is that uh, you know, initially there was a very large contribution, direct contrib contribution from energy, um, and it, there's still a pretty big uh, direct contribution. It's 42% in the October number, which is a lot bigger than, than, than the contribution uh, in the US number yesterday. The very large contribution from food, uh, but what's also true is core has definitely uh, picked up and it's uh, you know, just shy of 4% now 
I'll come back to that issue. So if you like, in terms of uh, you know, the, the kind of uh, pattern you see in the price level on the right side, is compared to pre-pandemic, uh, the energy price level has gone up by 60%, and the food price level has gone up by 17%. So this is obviously, within the overall inflation rate, very large uh, relative price movements. Now, you might say, well, okay, uh, let's look through energy, let's look at core. Uh, and, but of course, the issue is um, core inflation, I mean, every sector, when you have a 60% increase in the relative price of energy, energy is between about 5 and 10% of uh, input costs for different sectors. And so any, any, any industry is, to some extent, going to have to raise prices, even in these core categories, purely and simply because of the en energy shock. Now, on top of that is absolutely with the reopening of the European economy, especially from uh, March this year. If you recall, uh, around this time last year and the initial months of 22, Europe was quite locked down again. So the reopening really happened uh, March, April this year. Uh, but then, then it's been uh, quite something. So, so again, in the October numbers, uh, hotel prices at 21% up on the year. Uh, air, air, um, airfares 33% up on the year. So this is something that happened probably earlier in the US data, but, but it's basically uh, uh, qu quite something now in the European data. So the point I want to say there is, is essentially, uh, on the left side is the San Francisco Fed technique for supply demand decomposition, where you see uh, there's a significant supply component, but the demand co component has been uh, rising this year. But of course, within that demand component, one of the open questions is uh, whether there's a kind of one-time reopening effect which will level off or whether this basically is going to be more, more persistent. And then uh, when you think about, again, the issue about the seeping uh, influence of energy prices on other categories, uh, whether it's goods inflation, uh, what we call non-energy industrial goods, as opposed to just goods, uh, and uh, services inflation, you can see that uh, the, the roles, the sectors which have a lot of energy inputs have had much bigger price increases than other sectors. I, I don't show it here, but uh, by way of contrast, if you zero in on, on those uh, services, which are basically very labor intensive, there's not much inflation because in Europe, it's still the case so far, wage inflation is pretty limited. So when you look at sector by sector, uh, you're drawn to either these are sectors which use a lot of energy or these are sectors where the reopening effect, restaurants, uh, hotels, um, uh, fast food, those are the type of sectors where, again, there's been a, a big uh, price increases. So another way of saying this is, in some ways, core is not core, because there's non-core elements seeping into core at the moment. And again, uh, in terms of that demand component, you can look at this chart and say, wow, there's a really big increase in demand this year. Um, and this just goes to Q3, if you add Q, uh, Q2, I should say. If you add Q3, uh, there's more of that. So there has been a big increase in consumption this year. But we, again, in terms of levels, it, it's very much uh, you know, still uh, only approaching pre-pandemic levels. Of course, uh, that's hitting constrained supply. So it, it is contributing to inflation. But as supply bottlenecks ease, uh, you, you might imagine at least some of the rebalancing will be from the supply side. Okay, so let me turn to some open economy issues, which again are, are going to be different for, for the euro area than, than for the US. So in this graph, um, it's again, simple, simpler to accumulate from pre-pandemic to now. And what you see here is, is that kind of red box is the energy, the increase in the energy import bill. It's 3.3% uh, 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 of, of GDP. So, so that's a pretty big hit from, from the, in the terms of trade. Now, you do have to be a little bit uh, uh, universal here because, of course, Europe produces a lot of manufactured goods which have benefited from rising prices around the world. So there have been also rising export prices. So on net, the terms of trade has uh, declined by 1.8 percentage points of GDP. So let's round that to two. Two percent of GDP is a big hit. In, in terms of the typical amplitude of a business cycle. Um, but, but you know, it's important to look at it in, in, comprehensively rather than just at uh, the import side, side of it. And what you see, uh, one of the consequences is this trend down in, in the trade balance. 
uh, you know, with, with significant contribution uh, from uh, the rising import bill for energy. There's a lot of energy demand reduction this year, uh, but still the case in the end that there's still a, a basic inelasticity. So the price increase does incre uh, increase the import bill. Uh, and then it's also mapping out uh, in, into the behavior of, of exchange rates. So uh, you know, the IMF, of course, is the home of many equilibrium exchange rate models. Uh, but, but this is a, a version of an equilibrium exchange rate model uh, where on top of real factors, we, we add some nominal factors. And basically, in terms of the 19% depreciation of the year against the dollar since the start of 21, eight percentage points in this uh, calculation is the terms of trade. So you can imagine if there's a reverse in the terms of trade movement, how that might support the nominal exchange rate. Uh, now, then when you come to policy issues, fiscal policy, uh, this is our, um, from our own survey, you can see the vast difference between uh, the lower quintile groups and the higher quint quintile groups in terms of their exposure, whether to, to energy or, or connect to, to transportation. So it, it's pretty obvious here from a macro point of view, uh, unless you support those low quintile groups, there's gonna be a very big drop in consumption. The, these are people with high marginal propensities to consume, over and above the basic kind of equity reasons my, why you would want to support those groups. Uh, but uh, you can also look at that graph and say, well, you know, if I turn to the upper quintile groups, uh, the case is, is a lot weaker for, for, for um, generalized uh, support. Okay, one of the issues uh, I was asked to talk about is the differences in inflation rates across the Euro area. Uh, and, you know, the, of course, the most basic point here is a pretty strong connection between the, the basket weight. So the basket weight of energy food in the HICP is going to be bigger in the lower income member countries. And uh, what you see here is this, this huge uh, difference between the Baltics in the upper uh, right, right quadrant there and other countries. Um, and it's, you know, basically you go a long way by correlating with the very basic uh, expenditure share. Now, on top of that, uh, these are countries where the pass-through is much quicker, that they are price takers in, in, in many sectors, and, so, and also there's less uh, kind of a, of a culture of administered prices. So some of the ways uh, uh, prices have been uh, uh, increased more slowly elsewhere are not true there. Um, let me also say, by the way, there's probably going to be a bit of a mean reversion. You know, so this is uh, what's happened in 22 on the vertical axis, what happened in 21 on the horizontal. Okay, so the Baltics, uh, they've been hit twice, high inflation this year and last year. Uh, but if I, if I throw out on, uh, some of those countries, you're going to see a negative correlation. And I like to use the, the example of Spain, because Spain was early in allowing the energy prices to show up in retail prices, and now the inflation rate is lower than some other countries where, where they were uh, basically long-term contracts, other reasons to slow it down. And you see this here in, in the electricity prices since uh, July 21, uh, you have some countries like Spain um, and now the Netherlands uh, where there's been a big pass through, other countries, it's not yet there. And so what we do think at the ECB, the pass through to retail prices is not over. So even if there's a reversal in wholesale prices, uh, the impact on, on energy prices in our forecast in September is still ongoing uh, for quite a while yet. Okay, let me finish with, with uh, uh, fiscal. Um, and the commission uh, this morning uh, came out with, with new projections. Um, so what you see here uh, with debt ratios is it, it captures the step increase with the pandemic. But it also captures that there's been, a, you know, both so far and projected to continue for the next couple of years, a significant uh, reversion in, in, in debt ratios uh, because of the strong recovery uh, and, uh, you know, the, the effects of deflators and so on. Uh, and then if you look at, at um, behind this in terms of uh, deficits, what's happened this year has been a big uh, narrowing of fiscal deficits in Europe with a strong recovery in revenue and the ending of all sorts of pandemic supports. But basically what's true and what's projected by the Commission to be true for the next couple of years is that's kind of stalling now. So the, 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 the deficits will stall as opposed to uh, narrow more, more closely. Uh, and so the Commission today was estimating about one percentage point of GDP this year in energy supports 
And again, if they stick to the plan of, of these being temporary uh, measures, it'll be about another percentage point next year, more or less. And this is going to be one of the big fiscal questions is how to manage the transition from the policies this year to policies that uh, are more targeted and indeed um, having allowed a significant period of a uh, delayed adjustment. Um, if, these, if the energy prices do remain high, the reality is, is that uh, more of this will have to pass through to many households. And that's why we would always say uh, targeted uh, temporary measures rather than universal measures. But no doubt later on in the discussion, we'll have more time for some of these issues, but I should stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Carmen. Well, it's a, it's a real pleasure to be here, and I'm going to save my Maury memories for my, my lunch remarks. Uh, so I will um, just follow uh, pretty much the mandate that, that Pierre-Olivier uh, uh, spoke to earlier and talk about the various aspects of emerging market debt risks. Um, I'll start out with the good news and then deteriorate. Um, so th the good news is, you know, I, like many around here, live in fear of a 1980s replay. That is, I think, looms large, you know, the, 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 the replay where we saw uh, not just low-income countries, because when we say emerging markets, we have to realize that we're encompassing, covering a lot of ground, and there are issues already in low-income and frontier economies that are different from those of the middle-income. Uh, so, so the 1980s crisis uh, engulfed low-income and middle-to-middle-high-income countries, um, and I will go back to this. Uh, it, it was uh, very protracted, and it, it is an understatement to say it was a lost decade. It was actually, for many countries, especially the low income, uh, it was closer to lo two lost decades. Uh, so we're not there yet. That's, that's, that's good news. Um, and let me ha elaborate a little bit also why we're not there. Um, Typically, in, if you look at the long period of history, a long period of history, when you see big waves of defaults, uh, the global factors that accompany that are at least three recurring ones. One is, is, is a rise, a marked rise in international interest rates. Another one is a reversal of capital flows to emerging markets. And the third is a crash in commodity prices, big contraction in commodity prices. Those are sort of the three shoes that fall. They fell in the 1980s big time. They fell in the 1930s big time. They haven't, all three have not fallen yet. Uh, so, you know, commodity prices uh, haven't seen the, 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 the drama uh, certainly, if we had, it, and it's interesting because in the last 30 years, we haven't seen the, through, the three shoes drop. In 2015, which was a very bad year for emerging markets, 2000, and it actually marked a turning point that I'm going to allude to uh, in a minute. Um, in 2015, you had a, a crash in commodity prices. It was the end of the China super cycle in commodities. This is when China's growth rate slowed, uh, and, and you had a major reversal in, in capital flows, especially commodity producers. But you had a benign interest rate environment. Uh, now the tables have turned, and it's two factors. It's rising interest rates. Uh, it's, it's the reversal where we've gone from a long period of 
Not too long, because 2020 was definitely risk off. 2020 actually saw the biggest, in, in the spring of 2020, we had the biggest reversal in capital flows that I've seen since the 1930s, since the data that's available for the 1930s to emerging markets. Uh, but we went from you know risk, risk on to risk off, and so we've had the re we we are seeing uh, capital flow reversal. We are seeing rise in, in international interest rates. Does that mean that the preconditions uh, are ready uh, for a very broad based uh, emerging market crisis? I will say that the good news again is, is that we've seen only two out of the three prerequisites. Furthermore, I would argue that the rise in interest rates that we are seeing is mild compared to the very significant, in the case of the 1980s, in nominal and real interest rates, and in the case of the 1930s, in real interest rates, because deflation was so big in the 1930s that you had very a spike in, in, in real interest rates, and we're, we're not there. Uh, so that's one bit of good news. And I, as I said, I will deteriorate as I go along. Uh, the other part of good news is that if you look at external debt um, in, on a long time series basis, the share of short term debt uh, isn't as high uh, as it was in high vulnerability periods, including the run up to the the 1980s uh, debt crisis. And we know rollover risk uh, is, 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 is a big, big driver of, of, of debt crises. Um, that remark that I just made has to be very caveated, though, because we may not have a record high of short-term external debt, but variable rate debt is very high uh, in EMs, and so the pass-through of higher interest rates is poised to be fast. Uh, furthermore, we have a lot of domestic debt, and alas, this is this. It's going to be interesting how it may play out because a lot of the domestic debt issued during COVID is short-term uh, and is uh, tied to market rates, so it's, it's 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 variable rate in nature. Now, now. These, but, but the external debt composition is still relatively favorable, and now, what, now, now we go downhill. Uh, what is not good news? And, and I am going to get to uh, Pierre Olivier's uh, questions uh, more granularly. Uh, what is not good news is that in addition to rising interest rates, in addition to uh, avoidance of risk taking and a reversal, we have also a very strong dollar, which increases, of course, the uh, 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 debt servicing burden uh, for, for countries that have dollar debt. And do not forget that the very large debts owed to China are also overwhelmingly denominated uh, in US dollars. So, so external debt is in serious uh, uh, dollars. That's, that's a big minus. Another big minus, which is very different from the aftermath of the global financial crisis, uh, when the U.S., when Europe went into recession during the global financial crisis, and it was a long and protracted recession, uh, China was growing very rapidly. And this was a big engine of growth uh, for emerging markets because you know it, it stimulated trade, sti it, it kept, as I said, com the commodity, China's commodity cycle was very long uh, and it was importantly driven by the fact that between early 2000s and around 2013, Chinese growth uh, averaged double digits. Um, Pierre Olivier, how much do I have? Just because I... I, I'm, pr I'm prone to rambling, so I just want to make sure that. Um, uh, so so um, China's not going to be that engine of growth uh, this time around. And furthermore, when I talk about capital flow reversals and Calvo 
uh, Guillermo Calvo style sudden stops. We have a new kind of sudden stop, which is the net lending from China, which was China was a major lender to low, especially low income countries. There are middle income countries like Ecuador, uh, like Venezuela that also, you know, had, had, had Sri Lanka, had, they're all doing great as you, and anyway. Um, but the, the fact is reversals uh, are coming in two forms. They're coming from market forces, but they're also coming from reduced uh, net lending. Uh, Christoph Trebisch, Sebastian Horn, and I actually did a recent post in Box CU to that effect, showing that net flows from China have turned negative. Importantly, also because a lot of those bad debts, uh, a lot of that lending have have come into the bad debt category. And this, I will go to the question of, uh, are we then really talking about a broader based debt crisis? I would say it's not a hypothetical for low income countries. We're, we're already in, in very serious, for, for, if you look at the 74 countries that were eligible for the debt service suspension initiative, more than 60% of them now are either in debt distress or at high risk of debt distress. Among low income countries, uh, the debt problems are, are already very real. I think the biggest difference thus far has been uh, that the emerging market, the middle higher income, haven't been hit in the wave of, uh, in the way certainly that, that we saw in that domino effect around the early 1980s. Um, I'm going to conclude on what concerns I have about the already existing debt problem that is so prevalent in the low income and worries about if debt problems become manifest uh, in the middle income. And, and, and the, the, the thing that continues to worry me, and I spoke to this when I did the Mundell Fleming lecture a couple of years ago here, uh, is we still lack architecture. We have the common framework that was introduced by the G20 ostensibly to grad, you know, to, to wean countries out of the debt service suspension initiative, which was temporary cash flow relief, and deal with debt overhangs and debt write downs. We haven't seen a single write down. We haven't seen a single debt restructuring as yet. Chad, which was the first country that applied, uh, now is deemed a success, not because they restructured, but because oil prices went up, so that now they don't need debt restructuring. Um, so the big concern and a big challenge that I see ahead is that uh, very much like the 1980s, all the big players, and this is not just China, this is also the G7, I think are taking a wait and see uh, attitude and not really thinking about uh, what kind of debt restructuring uh, will be needed for the countries that are either the low income countries, many low income countries that are already in debt distress or the middle income ones that may be uh, in distress. So in that uplifting note, I'll end. Thank you, Carmen. Thank you very much. Let's turn it to Maury. Okay, this, this may be my one opportunity to um, um, thank everyone for coming to this and to, uh, to uh, uh, you know, I know Pierre Olivier will offer more detailed thanks at the end, but just to thank uh, the fund, uh, the MD, Gita, Pierre Olivier, the IMF Economic Review, and Andre for, uh, for organizing this, and uh, it's been really great. Um, it's also particularly gratifying to be on this panel. Uh, given the participants. Carmen was a student at Columbia when I started out in my career. Um, Philip was at Harvard and not my student, but we actually communicated by email when he was a graduate student. Um, he emailed me out of the blue, and uh, it's been great to see them evolve into really influential researchers and policymakers. Um, Jason uh, is, is 
even younger than me than they are. He was my boss at CEA. I learned a lot from him uh, there in terms of economics and since. Uh, he was, of course, one of the first people to um, uh, worry that the U.S. fiscal stimulus coming in early 2021 would lead to the inflationary outcome that it has. But what you may not know about Jason and what I, what, what I learned from him that was most valuable was um, how to be a manager. Uh, Jason is an incredible manager and an incredible leader. And at CEA, I carefully observed his skills and the way he created community. And uh, many times during my tenure as a research director, I sort of asked myself, OK, what would, what would Jason do? How would, how would he handle this? And uh, I couldn't really do it as well as he, but I think it, it helped me enormously. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, I did it right, great. Um, uh, as has been pointed out, for the first time in 40 years, um, global inflation at a high level is, is a real challenge. It's really a global mega shock, and it is the dominant factor driving monetary policies around the world today. Um, among central banks, uh, almost all of which have been raising interest rates at an almost unprecedented clip, it is the Fed's actions that are the most consequential uh, for the world economy. So we have to look at those very carefully. And this was true 40 years ago. Uh, it's true again. Um, globally, here's what inflation has done. These are data from Hever uh, for advanced and emerging economies. And they go through September. As of September, global inflation uh, had not begun to decline. Uh, in fact, it ticked up globally in that, in that month. And notwithstanding the data uh, that were just released for the US, US inflation remains high and core inflation remains high. And it is this surge in, in US inflation uh, that was uh, anticipated probably by the markets at some level before um, uh, many economists anticipated it. That, that has been driving uh, the, dollar, the dollar up. First, the expectation that the Fed would have to tighten before other major central banks, and now the actual tightening and the continuing strength of the US economy in the face of what the Fed has done. Uh, those continue and probably will continue to drive the dollar um, higher still. Uh, carrying out monetary policy in this uh, context of a once in 40 years mega shock that uh, was largely unexpected is very, is very challenging. Um, Jay Powell at Jackson Hole a couple of years ago talked about navigating by the stars. And uh, if you think about it, it's really difficult right now. Uh, first of all, U-star, the natural rate, where's that post-pandemic? Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty about that. Uh, we don't know if, if, if it is below 4%, if it is, is uh, uh, more like four and a half or five percent for the U.S. Uh, our star may be even more problematic. Uh, uh, we need to know the expected rate of inflation at some level or some measure of expectations to know where our star is relative to the natural rate. But uh, expectations are dependent on, on what the central bank is doing and is expected to do. If the central bank looks at survey data on inflation and expectations are lower, uh, and it concludes that uh, the actual market interest rate is too high and it loosens, that might cause inflation expectations to pop up if there's low credibility. So how do you actually um, uh, implement monetary policy? It's not really straightforward. And it may be, and this, this relates to um, the concern about financial conditions that Jason raised and uh, Linda's talk yesterday, that, that uh, our star, the way we usually define it, is not really a sufficient statistic for uh, uh, what monetary policy is doing and what effect it is, it is having. Uh, Carmen mentioned the 1980s, and I find it useful to think about what happened then and um, what happened now. Um, there, there, there are significant differences between the world now um, and then. Uh, 
First of all, what is happening now is following decades, literally decades, literally more than a generation of low inflation. Um, that was not the case in the early 1980s. There had been a buildup over uh, uh, a dozen years or more of inflationary pressures that uh, largely went unaddressed until Paul Volcker started to address them. Uh, also, the world is more complex financially, much more complex than it was then. Uh, it's much more indebted, both uh, publicly and by the private sector. And it's much more globally integrated, uh, especially in terms of finance. Uh, the world is more tightly knit together. Uh, these factors worsen some of the credibility problems that monetary policy faces. Uh, something we've been talking about more recently is uh, 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 financial dominance. You know, the idea that a concern over breaking something in the financial markets may hamper uh, central banks in, in addressing inflation problems. And this was, this was discussed most recently in the context of the UK, um, the Bank of England seemingly uh, reversing its quantitative tightening to deal with uh, disruptions in the, uh, the guilds market. Uh, fiscal dominance remains a problem, and unlike uh, the sort of luxury we had uh, over pre-pandemic years when, and even during, during much of the pandemic, when fiscal and monetary policy were working together, they may, may well be working at odds uh, going forward, and that is going to raise credibility problems as well. But I think the economic risks of disinflation are also uh, greater, uh, and that's somewhat related to the credibility problems. Um, uh, the world is not linear. Like We like to work with linear models as economists, but the world is not linear. And particularly in financial markets, there can be worrisome nonlinearities, um, and in fact, uh, uh, tipping points. Uh, that could arise in opaque markets. Again, the UK provides an example of that risk. Uh, Olivia, in a recent tweet, I think put, put the situation we're in uh, quite well. Um, he focused on the lags in monetary policy, uh, the idea that um, if you had full information, uh, if you were fully credible, it might be optimal to uh, start tightening before, stop tightening before inflation uh, f started to come down, and uh, he highlighted the, the credibility risk that that would raise. And I think, I think his, his points really show that there is a, an important trade-off. I mean, there's a risk of going too far in terms of harming the economy. Uh, there's a risk to credibility. Uh, again, this, this is the, the, the difficulty of really judging uh, how markets are processing what you as a central bank are doing and uh, using that to forecast the future. And you have to trade these off. The policymaker has to trade this, these off. And he concluded th this tweet by saying there's no easy answer. And I think this is definitely true. So we all have to reach our assessments of where we are. Um, I would judge that from here on in, uh, more policy tightening is needed. Uh, you know, as Carmen said, inter interest rates are not really at that high a level compared to past uh, contraction cycles, and certainly not compared to the inflation uh, globally that has not started to come, come down. Um, on the other hand, uh, uh, I do think that, that central bankers have to be more than usually attentive to what's going on abroad. Uh, to the actions and the reactions abroad because the, the global economy is an integrated system. Uh, for the U.S., it's more closed. Uh, the paper that Gianluca presented yesterday illustrated um, uh, you know, how, this, how this very interesting fact plays into what the global outcome will be, but nonetheless, I think there might may be unknown, uh, uh, unknowns out there. And uh, communication is, is a challenge, but my judgment would be that um, credibility may not be as, as big a problem as we fear 
given that central banks, albeit belatedly, have kind of gotten the message and started to act and started to communicate their goals more effectively. Um, I think we, we should start worrying at least, not pivoting, but worrying at least about some of the unintended consequences that, that may arise. Um, I say this within the context of a, a global economy that is much more fragile and much more close to tipping points in several ways. And Pierre Olivier um, alluded to these, uh, pretty much all of these at the beginning. And uh, you at the fund have been working on these, so I'll just uh, mention this. So there are certainly financial risks, but there are other risks uh, of tipping points. Climate, we're almost certainly near some very worrisome tipping points. Uh, the melting of the permafrost, uh, 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 the Arctic permafrost, uh, glaciers melting, um, effects on weather patterns. These are things that may not be easily reversible and that could have macroeconomic consequences. I'm not saying that monetary policy has to loosen because we're worried about climate change, but as we think about the global situation and things that might happen, it's good to keep these in mind. Um, health. COVID illustrated a major uh, tipping point, uh, a microbe, uh, something that ev either evol probably evolved by random evolution, um, I, I don't want to get into lab leak issues, uh, changed the world permanently. It changed the world permanently. And there are other health risks out there that we haven't really started to, to look at. Politically, polarization creates political tipping points. You have an election. Uh, it changes things possibly permanently. It may change your institutions in ways that can be very hard to uh, address. Geopolitics, similarly, um, the, uh, the uh, Ukraine uh, invasion by Russia may be a geopolitical tipping point that fragments the world for a long, long time. Uh, uh, so we want to build a, a more resilient world we need more cooperation along all these dimensions I've mentioned, uh, but it is uh, in short supply. Um, uh, you know, my last message, therefore, will be, uh, this illustrates to me why it's so important uh, to have institutions such as this one uh, that can talk to all the players, that can recommend the right policies. Uh, they may not listen uh, right away, but it's important to be out there with the right insights and the right messages. Thank you. Thank you, Maury. Very um, sobering, but also very insightful uh, remarks. Let me turn it back maybe first to the panelists in case you'd like to react to each other's presentations. I can also throw in some questions if you'd like, but I thought that maybe um, there would be different views on monetary policy, obviously, uh, between Jason and Maury. <laughs> so, Jason, if you want to start. I want to talk about my management skills. Yeah. Go ahead, <laughs> please. But, um, uh, yeah, I mean, on the, the lags, Maury, I mean, I, I agree it's an impossible thing when they're long and variable to, to understand it. I would make two points, though. One is the Fed hasn't actually tightened monetary policy in the last two months, and it doesn't have any plans to tighten monetary policy if you measure monetary policy by financial conditions and what's ultimately affecting the economy. Largely what they're doing is following through on the path they already telegraphed, if anything, um, a more dovish path than it. Um, the second thing I'd say is, you know, if your rule is that you're gonna wait until inflation gets to two, and you're gonna keep tightening until inflation gets to two, then you're guaranteed to overshoot. If your rule is, you know, infl core inflation's been running at 5%, and you're going to start holding off when core inflation falls to 4%, you're not guaranteed um, any sort of overshoot. And I think we're closer to that second world than we are to the first world. And in that sense, I think monetary policy now is much more sensible and symmetric than it was a year ago. A year ago, the Fed's explicit rule was we will not raise interest rates to 25 basis points until we're already at maximum employment. That guaranteed an overshoot, which maybe made sense at first, but by the time we had overshot, to stick with that overshoot 
um, I think was, in retrospect, doesn't look so great. Um, this isn't any rule like that. Um, it isn't saying we need to get all the way um, there. So I guess I'm, on balance, a little bit less worried about lags, although it's possible we're both arguing against the same thing. I'm not in favor of them shocking everyone at the December meeting and dramatically tightening financial conditions with a you know, 100 basis point Fed funds rate. I don't disagree with that. You don't disagree with that. <laughs> um, let me maybe uh, follow up with a, a question to Phil. Um, I mean, I, I was struck by your figure on the real exchange of a difference in inflation rates in the different um, the countries of the euro. That translates into differences in, in, in uh, real exchange rates, obviously. Um, and a large part of this, it seems to me, is indirectly coming also from fiscal measures that have been implemented in some countries versus others in trying to deal with the energy crisis. I mean, you can think of the low inflation in Spain relative to some of the Baltics or even France coming from very generous price caps that have been protecting um, some of the households and so on, not feeding into the CPI. So that's clearly a situation where fiscal policy at the national level starts having an impact on inflation. Obviously, that's something that is the core mandate of the ECB. So how do you, how do you view that? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I think there's a various levels to that. So, so one, I mean, if we do zero in on, on uh, direct interventions in the pricing, the retail pricing of energy, um, I mean, I think everyone can agree the ideal uh, scheme, if you're going to do it, um, means that, that, that the, above some uh, fairly low level of consumption, above that level, the price mechanism should be there to send a signal. So designing schemes, which is true in different countries, but you might argue where the kink is. You might argue that maybe uh, it should, be, it should be kind of pushed in, uh, the, the, the price at which, you, or, or the consumption level at which uh, you, you, you pay the market price. So I, I think that's an element. Um, there's an element, um, going back to temporary, which is, um, I mean, one thing everyone's learning is the, the pricing strategies of utility companies, you know, it's, it's pretty difficult for these companies now to work out uh, do I basically uh, pass through very quickly the wholesale price, which is true in some countries? Uh, what are the, you know, if I s sign a long-term contract, I'm going to, you know, the, I face two-sided risk of either setting too high a price, too low a price. Uh, and then, uh, obviously, if you've <laughs> set a long-term contract a while ago, where your costs have gone up a lot, and now when you've got an opportunity to reset, uh, you know, it's very much a kind of a, a significant, uh, you can have these, these non-linear jumps. But let me come to some you know, core issues for, for monetary policy. One is, uh, I mean, Jason already said it, but I mean, it's commonplace, and we all believe it to some degree, which is uh, experience does influence the formation of expectations. So if inflation has gone sky high, um, then in terms of, I, I'm not so sure it necessarily matters for long-term inflation expectations. So you may believe eventually, the center, eventually, as you said, this, the two, it'll come, come back to two. Uh, but in terms of, uh, if you say, well, uh, with this inflation rate, I know not just myself, but everyone else in the economy is going to look for significant uh, wage increases next year. Then, then the one year ahead, the two year ahead, the three year ahead expected inflation uh, could be significant. So if you have countries where basically they, they have suppressed the inflation rate now, there is, I think, there will be a kind of uh, easing of the second round pressure. So, so, so that is a pro. Uh, the question is, can you marry that with still retaining the price signal? And then the third element is the financing. So you, you can basically, uh, if you're targeted in temporary, uh, be able to have the intervention. So the, the European Commission today calculated that, that the, in the aggregate for the year area, the amount of energy intervention this year is about one percentage point of GDP. So you know, if that is fully deficit financed, you know, that's going to have an impact in terms of overall uh, demand dynamics. However, there are you know, tax increases uh, that could be considered. Let me mention, by the way, on fiscal, the connection between fiscal and inflation, 
there's a huge uh, rotation in fiscal towards transfers. And so if transfers have a lower multiplier because those who uh, uh, have some you know, uh, uh, spare cash may just add to their savings rather than spend it, the multiplier, the same f f fiscal deficit could have a lower multiplier uh, if you've rotated from government consumption and government investment uh, towards transfers. So, you know, I think uh, all of this, uh, you know, uh, need, needs a lot of consideration. But what I would say maybe fundamentally for Europe, because debt levels are so different as I showed, uh, I mean, uh, the Commission, the Eurogroup, everyone is, is clear, everything has to be anchored in, in downwardly sloping uh, debt ratios. And it's very important to, to make sure that, that, you know, any temporary interventions, temporary targeted, are consistent with downward and more downwardly sloping for those with high debt. And you know, these are things that are easy to say, um, but in, to implement that is going to be very important, uh, not just next year, but in the years to come. Thank you, Philip. Carmen, let me turn to you. Jason says the Fed is right. It should be increasing rates. The dollar appreciates. It's not directly the problem of the Fed. They may consider spillback effects, but emerging market economies should be dealing with it with their own instruments. Any reaction? So look, uh, I think we can't lose sight. And one of Phil's slides highlight, highlighted that this spike in inflation, inflation is a regressive tax. Uh, and the relative price swings that we have seen tilted towards food and energy have made this inflation spike a particularly regressive shock uh, after COVID, which was a regressive shock. So emerging markets also have very good reasons for dealing with their uh, inflation problems, uh, apart from you know, beyond thinking of macro stabilization. Uh, inflation spikes, food crises. And Maury pointed this out, you know, uh, in the context of, of, you know, instability and, and, and geopolitical uh, dimension that you see that at the, at the country level as, as well. So uh, emerging markets, um, you know, it, it's, there is no nice, elegant way of getting out of the inflation, but they have to tackle uh, their own uh, inflation problems, despite the fact that uh, this may mean, and I alluded to this in my remarks, quite a substantive uh, fiscal impact for those that issued a lot of short-term debt during the COVID crisis, and that's a long list of countries. And last, I would say on that, that, you know, um, uh, with regard to the strengthening dollar, um, they're caught in a very, I don't envy central bankers anywhere right now, but I, you know, certainly in the EM space, if you follow the dollar at this stage, you may be tempted to do that because you're inflate, you, you're, you're worried about higher inflation uh, pass through if you let your currency go. Uh, so it makes the inflation situation. If you follow the dollar, you face another risk. Has anyone noticed that China's currency has been depreciating very significantly? That was also a precursor to the Asian crisis. When they unified their currency in January of 1994, uh, it meant a lot of the EM currencies became overvalued. So it's, it's a tough call uh, what to do with the dollar, uh, but my sense is they're going to tighten, but not, not, uh, this, is not this is not a blanket statement. Look at Eastern Europe and look at Latin America and you see very different policy responses. And just very quickly in case anyone thinks I'm totally heartless. I think monetary policy already has two objectives and one instrument, so I wouldn't add more objectives to it. In the United States, though, I mean, you listen to Carmen, we should be much more aggressive about debt relief, especially for the poorest countries, about supporting the IMF, both multilateral and other efforts. So there's a lot we should do 
just shouldn't load it all on one instrument in one institution to try to do all those things. I, I forgot uh, um, when, when I was talking about the inflation differentials to make two basic points. One, um, they, they are passing through, not one for one, but, but to some degree into uh, wage inflation differentials and therefore changes in, in competitiveness. Uh, and, and that can have very, very persistent effects. So, so that, I think, is going on. But there's a, there's a second channel classically in the monetary union, which is the real interest rate channel, which is you know, with the same uh, uh, policy rate if the inflation differential, you know, those high inflation countries. And you know, it is, will be persistent uh, for some uh, degree. You might say, well, if I have a super negative real interest rate, you know, that's going to support demand, uh, invite more credit creation, all of that. That channel is probably quite weak because these are countries where the uncertainty is very high. Uh, it's not exactly the circumstances under which uh, I think uh, people are, are taking advantage of super low real rates. So, so I would say uh, the, the, uh, the competitiveness channel is there, but I'm not so sure the real interest rate channel is super powerful right now. Very good. Thank you, Phil. Maury, did you want to? No, I just have a question, um, uh, sort of more for, for Jason and Philip, which is, um, you know, this, this whole discussion uh, uh, that, that sort of emerged in, in 2021 about inflation um, debate, it, it was kind of upended by the Ukraine invasion. And, you know, some of those commodity price effects were, were um, maybe may arguably temporary, but it certainly gave a fillip to inflation and probably inflation expectations in a number of countries, uh, you know, more, more persistently in Europe than in the U.S. And I wonder in your assessment, you know, is there, uh, you know, what, what would be your um, counterfactual about where we would be without that? I'm not sure that's an interesting question for policy purposes, but in terms of, you know, assessing the appropriateness of policies before the invasion, you know, where do you, where do you think we would be now? I, I, I can take it on, but oh. I don't you want to go well, first. You know, I think there has been an overstatement of the degree of pass-through of commodity prices to core inflation. Um, there's two effects. One is direct. The price of oil goes up, so the price of jet fuel goes up, so the price of airfares goes up, or, or I'd call that mechanical. There's also a behavioral effect that goes the other way, which is you can no longer afford your gasoline, so you spend all your money on gasoline and you don't go to restaurants anymore and you get less restaurant inflation. Past research that's tried to quantify these two effects has found you know, the sort of net of them could be a small positive, um, could be a small negative, but isn't dramatic. And just to give a sort of gut check on that, um, in 2005, we saw over a 12-month period energy prices go up 36% in the United States. Core inflation over that period was 1.9. Over the last 12 months, energy prices are up 18% in the United States, half of the increase we saw in 2005, and core inflation is up 6%. And so we would have had very, very high core inflation um, even without. Now, the extra inflation on top of that um, you know, getting all the way to nine, that was definitely um, the invasion. But core inflation itself, I think it's plausible it would have been a little bit lower, um, but only a little bit. So in the uh, European context, February, March uh, this year had basically uh, two forces. So there's a confounding effect. One is absolutely the war. Uh, and the war, uh, if you look at I me, mean, it's such a gigantic breakpoint for... Uh, consumer confidence, investor confidence, all of these absolutely, there's a real discontinuity around that point. Um, and also the, I mean, I think it's fairly sure that the uh, price of gas has remained, has, you know, and it's, it's not just where it is now, but the expectation it's going to, to be high next year uh, does connect to the war. But this is basically also when the European economy reopened, when enough people had been vaccinated and the winter wave had died down. So it was around March, so within the same ballpark, that we, have see, we did see a very large increase in consumption. Um, and and so, so what I would say to what Jason just said, which is conceptually correct, 
is that essentially uh, the, the impact, the, the near-term effect was all of these sectors in reopening also were uh, having to take account of the cost increase, the jet fuel effect, other effects. Uh, and to the extent various countries did protect people initially from the, in retail prices, that the kind of uh, real income effect of high energy prices is only happening now. So, so I would say the, the, the demand channel is one reason why the Commission today does have a recession in Europe now, this quarter, and going into next quarter. Um, so the, it, the, the exact timing of when over the course of a year or two, uh, which channel dominates, uh, the disinflationary impact you know, may, may not have uh, uh, fully played out. So we do have a confounding effect here. Now, maybe fundamentally, and this is why I showed the price level, not just the inflation rate at the start, is that one of the big issues for Europe is going to be, is this a permanent in terms of trade loss? Uh, and this is both for the present value of people's incomes, uh, for consumption decisions, for firms. Uh, firms could have been said, okay, I'll struggle through with high energy prices for a while. But at some point, if you're in an energy intensive uh, firm or sector, and you've got permanently high and the energy issue is not global, because with the gas price differential between North America and the Gulf vis-a-vis -vis Europe, uh, there is a, a kind of a competitiveness issue here, because there's always the choice to import or to relocate to where uh, there's cheaper energy. So, so these are really big issues which have to do with the kind of medium-term outlook, which very much connects to the future of the war and the future of geopolitics. And so even if, uh, some of the big increases fall out of the, inf the inflation rate because you know, inflation is the rate of change, it's not the level. Uh, it doesn't mean uh, the, these issues don't disappear. I, I, I have the sense that certainly if you, if you listen to the media, there's a lot of confusion between um, inflation, the rate of inflation and the level of prices. <laughs> you know, it's just like people can't get it right on, on TV. But, uh, and, and, you know, I get you, it wrong in like one out of five of my tweets. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, you're trying to squeeze the words in, I guess. <laughs> but, um, you know, like you think about, about food prices, for example, like even before the Ukraine war, they were at a historically high level. And then they, you know, went even higher. And, and, like, and, and certainly in, in the emerging world and the developing world, e even with some easing, the, the effects have been devastating socially and, uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, fiscally and along many dimensions. Okay, with this, I would like to leave some time for the audience if you have any questions. So please, there are two mics. Please line up behind uh, each of the mics and I'll call on you. Um, we are being streamed, so please identify yourself before you ask your questions so the online uh, participants or audience can uh, know who you are. Uh, why don't you start? Okay, I'm uh, Charlie Kimball with the Korea Center for International Finance. Uh, I'd like Jason to elaborate on your incomplete hard landing and tell us what you think it means, not for next year, but for the following year in terms of how much GDP might be down over the two years combined. And then I'd like Philip to discuss for Europe, perhaps that means instead of downward sloping debt to GDP, maybe if Jason's fourth scenario, his most likely scenario comes true and plays out for a couple of years, what that might mean for debt to GDP ratios in Europe. And then for Carmen, doesn't this threaten middle income emerging markets also if we have a continued hard landing that lasts for a couple of years? Thank you. Okay, we're, we're gonna take a few questions and then, and then aggregate, so uh, please. Uh, Ted Trump. Ted Truman at the Basavar Robani Center for Business and Government at Harvard, Harvard Kennedy School. Quite a mouthful, by the way. Uh, uh, I'd like, this is actually a question for Bill. Uh, uh, there are two sides to the argument that 
Maury has made about uh, central banks perhaps going too far at some point. One is that they, uh, one is the question just put that way. The other is that the central banks don't, aren't taking account of what's happening elsewhere. Uh, as someone who was in the business of taking account of what's happening elsewhere, uh, I wonder whether you, you share that concern uh, or how you, how you at the, because you're the only practicing central banker on the panel, if I put it that way, uh, whether you think that is a, a major concern uh, or in terms of your, your thinking and the thinking of other central banks that you uh, uh, talk to in the Basel con context. Thank you. Uh, yes, I, I'm Joe Gagnon, uh, Peterson Institute for International Economics. Uh, my question is for Phil, although I think anyone might want to comment, I was struck by the, the, the chart you showed that showed a fairly large demand component to uh, inflation in Europe, and I think that's the San Francisco Fed methodology that, that looks at very micro data. But if you look at more aggregate data, uh, in based on reasonable but debatable assumptions about aggregate demand and supply slopes, uh, you could argue that nominal GDP is aggregate demand and then the split between inflation and growth is aggregate supply. On that measure, the U.S. has a big aggregate demand increase over the pre-pandemic trend, but Europe does not. As of Q2, you were right on the nominal GDP trend. Is that, uh, and that would justify a very different monetary response, much less, if any, in Europe compared to the U.S. Do you think that's a useful way to look at it? And, and do you have any sense of you know, why? I don't know why this discrepancy loomed so large. I was surprised to see it. But you know, some people out there think that central banks should stabilize uh, nominal GDP or aggregate demand, which would be comforting for you to point to, I would think. Yeah, Linda. Linda Goldberg, New York Fed. So um, in terms of looking back, instead of the moving forward part. Um, in early in the pandemic, across the world, we had very um, aggressive uh, responses, fiscal, monetary, prudential. Um, now that you have um, history, time having passed since those responses, um, are there any lessons that you would take from uh, what might be done differently in the future um, if some kind of shock like that hits again. So do you think that there was any direction where there was too much aggressiveness or too little? Um, what would be your view on that? Okay, let's take the last question and then back to you. Thank you. Peter Williams, Evercore ISI. Um, I'm mostly curious, I think a lot of the debates about movements in the stars have focused on the Nairu or potential GDP, but I'm curious what you all might think about R star moving after the pandemic and then subsequent supply shocks as well, especially in the context of you know extreme amounts of fiscal policy over the last couple of years. Obviously, most curious for Phil's opinion, but probably least likely to give it. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Jason, why don't we start with you and we'll sure I'll I'll take um, some of those. You know, I, I think the market, the way people talk that feels most wrong to me is that inflation is dichotomous. It's this disease you have and then the disease is cured, whereas it's a continuum and there's a lot of numbers between eight and two that it could take on. Um, and that, um, you know, that everything will proceed monotonically. So you sort of, you know, maybe you have your recession and then inflation is gone, rates go up and then rates go back down again, et cetera. Historically, these things have taken multiple passes. And so could you go through a recession? Maybe it's a shallow recession, which I think is the most likely scenario where we're sitting now. You come out of it with high risk inflation. And so you need to raise rates again. Um, maybe you even need to raise them higher than where they were going into the recession. So some type of sort of multi-year non-monotonic process to me would be sort of modal um, case here. What exactly it is, I don't know. Um, but I don't think it's, you know, the Fed cuts rates at the end of next year and keeps them low um, forever. The, um, you know, Linda, your question, um, I think the 2020 response was superlative. I think everything done by the New York Fed was superlative. Um, I think, though, that we learned that when people say things like, 
um, you know, it's better to err on the side of too much rather than too little, um, that you can actually err on the side of too much, that we obviously did that in the United States on fiscal policy. We gave people an amount of money sufficient for them to consume at about 120% of what they were previously consuming at in an economy where initially because of the pandemic and then because of supply chains, we couldn't produce you know, more than 90% of what they were consuming. And that is, in 2020, I had no idea how to size the fiscal relief. I was sitting there in March working with policymakers, and I just had no clue as to how to think about the appropriate size. By the summer of 2020, we knew much better what the output gap was, what a likely trajectory for the economy, what a multiplier was. And so I think there was basically no excuse for um, putting in an amount of fiscal stimulus that was several multiples of the output gap. And I think the consequences of that are higher inflation, lower real wages, and that you sort of accelerated your gains to some degree, um, but you know, spread the pain out um, later and maybe increase the total amount of pain insofar as you did something like raised expected inflation in the process. So you know, hopefully next time, um, you know, I'm more worried, frankly, that we're going to do too little, not too much. But you know, hopefully we won't just keep alternating mistakes, um, but we'll get it right the third time. Philip. So um, on Ted's uh, question, obviously, we would also have a big uh, international group who, d who does that. Uh, uh, and it's honestly, it's the first part of the process for building our, our forecast is, is the assessment of what's going on in the rest of the world. So it's a starting point. Um, so in the sense of uh, everything that feeds into that, into that including the, the, the role of monetary policy elsewhere, it, it is absolutely there. What I would say, I mean, the usual partition of the spillover uh, of U.S. monetary policy is there. You have the, the uh, projected uh, effect on, on global uh, uh, activity levels, uh, global commodity prices, uh, tradable good prices, all of the ways in which uh, U.S. monetary policy uh, does have a fairly significant footprint on global activity levels. So even though U.S. European trade is quite limited bilaterally, that global channel is very important. The second channel is through arbitrage in the financial system. So absolutely, you know, when there's a higher risk-free dollar rate, uh, it's going to push up rates, you know, and earlier on, you know, someone, I think you might have said, is or star a sufficient indicator for the state of the financial system? They, I mean, there's no shortcuts. You have to look at all of the different uh, uh, rates that are relevant uh, uh, for, for, for the uh, financial conditions. Um, and those two effects play out very significantly, especially in the medium term. And then on top of that, you have the exchange rate effect. Uh, now, the exchange rate effect probably operates more quickly and it pushes in the other direction. So, you know, we, we, you know so I think uh, we're very mindful uh, uh, of all of that. I mean, uh, on Orstar, I mean, this is where there's this kind of painful lack of uh, c uh, consistency about what we are talking about when we talk about this topic. So, you know, I usually try and refer to asymptotic or star. So basically, when all shocks have uh, disappeared, inflation's at two, uh, there's, there's no shock going on, everything's steady, what is the, the rate you need to sustain that in that kind of uh, ongoing steady state? Uh, Gita at Jackson Hole had a nice presentation about here's the plus and minus influences on that rate. I have an open mind about those uh, long-term influences, and I also don't particularly think it's super relevant right now, because the scale of this, the, the kind of non-asymptotic uh, appropriate interest rates, so this is why we say we're going to raise rates to the level needed to bring inflation back to 2% in a timely manner, where the timely manner is trying to, so you, you can't, you know, just take your, your, your time excessively because the longer inflation is above target, the more likely uh, people will update. Um, and that level is going to be driven by cyclical considerations. And you know, the list of factors in Europe you might think about is very obviously the interest rate we started out with is, was a super low rate, uh, well below neutral. 
uh, we, we have uh, a labor market where the, uh, if you look at it in the aggregate, whether you look at unemployment or vacancies, at the very least there are questions about whether there's cyclical tightness there. Th there are some issues there which might ease itself in terms of the return of international workers which, which, who went home basically in, in the pandemic. Fiscal is more supportive than normal, but, but there's definitely a, an element there which is cyclical, not long-term support. So Peter, in terms of what goes into Orsa, Orsa, I would have thought it's kind of the steady state deficit is the Orsar component, not the temporary. And, and then of course, inflation being uh, way above target, that creates cyclical issues in terms of real interest rate behavior uh, and so on, which, which has to take into account. So for us, in terms of where the interest rate needs to be uh, to bring inflation back to 2% in a timely manner, uh, those cyclical considerations, uh, the reversal of loosening, so you know, at the very least coming away from uh, having well below neutral rates, uh, and then also taking into account these other factors. On, suppl on supply capacity, it, there's a little bit of a complication factor here. One is the supply bottlenecks are easing. Definitely inflation is being uh, pushed up by, by, by all sorts of uh, limitations on supply. But we do think that's easing. And so uh, one type of supply factor will improve, which will be disinflationary. On the other hand, we do have to make the assessment, going back to what I said, which is if energy prices are high indefinitely, how much that erodes potential output, which is a... Now, I would say this is not a new surprise to us. All year long, projection by projection, there has been revisions in our views of potential output. Um, but we, we have to continuously uh, assess that. Uh, maybe I will uh, stop there. Thank you, Philip. Carmen. So uh, should we worry about middle-income, high-income countries um, over and beyond the, the, the low income that, that we know or of which the majority are in debt distress? The answer is absolutely yes. Let me divide that into two parts. The first part is initial conditions. In uh, middle income countries uh, also deteriorated markedly even before COVID. And by that I mean if you look at uh, whether it's external debt, public debt, uh, government debt, private debt, various debt markers in varying degrees, but they, the, the, the trend was definitely significantly upward even before COVID. Uh, really around 2015, you, you, you start seeing the debt numbers. Uh, so, so there are definitely more vulnerabilities on that score. Debt servicing costs, despite being in a low for long uh, interest rate environment, had been rising. Debt servicing costs had, had risen particularly for the middle to high income countries, even to, relative to the low income, because the low income were getting more concessional rates. Uh, so th those are areas of vulnerability, vulnerability, but I'd like to highlight that we've been discussing here focusing on sovereign debt crises. But, you know, Maury in his tipping point slide also points in the direction of a variety of other vulnerabilities. Uh, you know, certainly, uh, you know, when we think of, of uh, Turkey at the moment, we are not thinking necessarily imminently of a sovereign debt crisis, but inflation or, you know, upwards of 70% uh, might be called an inflation crisis. Um, if you look at the World Development Report that we did, we were flagging there also importantly some of the private sector, some of the uh, uh, problems that are to some degree hidden in balance sheets, in private sector balance sheets in, in, the, in the financial sector because uh, during COVID, uh, there was a lot of forbearance in many emerging markets, uh, middle income emerging markets, forbearance in which uh, non-performing loans are no longer being classified as non-performing loans. And, and these kinds of vulnerabilities can, can really 
uh, you know, come acutely forward uh, if recession, if a global recession is longer, if the spike in interest rate is higher or lasts longer, if there are local conditions that change. I mean, um, you know, uh, Brazil has done brilliantly in, in, in dealing with the inflation spike, but now, you know, with the Lula re-election, there's all kinds of concerns. So it, I think I stick to my point that sovereign debt crises in the middle to high income are not quite at the extremes, you know, that, that we saw on the onset of a, of, of, of the wave of defaults of the 1980s. Uh, but there are plenty of vulnerabilities that can, can change that pretty quickly. And just a, a brief second on Linda's question. L Linda, my sense is too early to be drawing many lessons uh, because, you know, the, I mean, there's the old saying, you know, the opera ain't over till the fat lady sings, and this opera is not yet over. Um, but importantly also, when we try to draw lessons, uh, it's going to be complicated by the fact that, for example, the, the fiscal stimulus, the monetary stimulus, and, and this is in, also, we highlighted this in the World Development Report, was very, very different, and it's been documented in, in, in a number of, of IMF publications, very different for the advanced economies than it was for the middle-income countries and for the low-income countries. Many, you wouldn't know they had a pandemic uh, in terms of a fiscal response because there was very little. Um, now, it is true that the advanced economies recovered better uh, than the middle-income and the middle income recovered better than the low income. But there were also a lot of constraints on the low and middle income that the advanced economies didn't have. So I wouldn't directly, you know, without really careful study attributed to the, to the, to the response to the pandemic. Thank you, Carmen. We're uh, already over time, but I want to make sure that we have uh, a few minutes for Mori's final words of wisdom. I'll try to, I'll try to be brief. Um, you know, a lot, part of what we've talked about, and this was Ted's question, is international spillovers of policies. Uh, and Carmen has certainly highlighted a lot of those in her presentation. I think international spillovers are, are normal, and in normal circumstances, central banks forecast them. Uh, they can offset foreign shocks to some degree, and uh, they're not a huge problem. I think history teaches us however, that in situations of exceptional stress with um, big common shocks, uh, there's a possibility of beggar thy neighbor effects, which can lead to much worse collective outcomes. So I think uh, central bankers just need, need to keep in mind that as important as their domestic problems are, um, there are uh, repercussions abroad, which, which could ultimately affect domestic outcomes. And, um, this is not to say that necessarily there would be big deviations in policy, but just in terms of thinking about how the world hangs together, uh, you know, this is something the fund does all the time, and uh, it's important for, for, I think, a broader policy community to you know, sort of raise their heads and think about what's going on elsewhere. Okay, so I really want to thank our uh, four panelists. I mean, I think uh, we can all give them a big round of applause. I mean, it's been... <laughs> we're certainly very privileged to have all the expertise and wisdom that you brought to this panel. Um, we very much need it here at the fund, and I think this is, uh, will take a, away a lot of the messages and, and work on them in, uh, in weeks and months to come. So thank you again. <laughs>